You represent uh, that classic generation of science fiction writers, I think, who influenced so many of them of today's scientists, space scientists particularly, but scientists in general. Yeah, and we kind of intended to. A lot of my stories, and they're still they're just coming out again now on Kindle, which that's awesome. I sell a lot of them through that. They took place in about the year 2010 to 2020 in that time period. And, of course, we had asteroid colonies and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, what went wrong? I can't... Moon, a moon base. We, had ha we were supposed to have HAL 9000 by 2001. What went wrong? Well, we almost could make HAL 9000 now, We could I guess, do it now, but, yeah. But, yeah, most of the 2000... What went wrong was... Uh, NASA, and I, don't, I wouldn't. Would you blame NASA? Or would you blame government funding for space exploration? Look, I was there. We were determined to beat the Russians to the moon, and for a while it looked like we weren't doing it. And everybody got scared. So basically, NASA turned the moon project at, at the only orders of the president. It got turned over essentially to General Phillips and the Air Force. Now, it was still a NASA project, but it was being managed by General Phillips, the guy who had put the Minuteman together. Well, the military has a way of doing things. It's basically you call in a bunch of competent people and you go, you take the job you've got to do and you break it down into as many smaller jobs as you can. And you put somebody in charge of each one of those projects that you think can do it. So you call in this guy, you, you've just become the laundry officer. Sir, I'm a master tech. I don't care what you are. I know you can do this job. Go do it. Next case. So you get a lot of misassignments, but you end up with essentially somebody covering everything that ever has to happen. Right. And I don't think most people realize that the second most complicated operation in the history of humanity was the Apollo moonshot. Oh, I think that's not surprising. It was the second most. What do you think the most complicated was? The most complicated project. Mm -hmm. In the history of the world. In the history of the world. Well, that's a good question. The Boulder Dam? No, June the 6th. D-Day, of course. D-Day, of course. Of course. It involved more people yeah. and more machines and more... Op well, Le a From a logistical well, point of view, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. so we did it. We put man on the moon. Now, the Russians had given up trying before we did it, but we were desperate we didn't know enough. That. Well, we didn't know it until late in the yeah. race. We were desperate enough that we had a project I took part in called uh, Pilgrim. We had a couple of Air Force Johnnies who were willing to volunteer for a one-way soft Ooh. land on the moon, build yourself a big hutch. And hope to God that we can come get you. <laughs> and that's probably, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what happens with Mars. Well, we had guys that were willing to do it. And more than that, uh, we have plans. I worked on some of that. No habitat. kidding. Now, it, by the time, by, as, as it got later in the program, it became obvious we didn't need that. that we were going to be first, and that was that. But that's how desperate we were. I remember hearing so, uh, recordings released only recently of JFK just f f furious about how this was going and, and, and really emphasizing how important it was. Well, that Kennedy emphasized how important it was and the rest of it, but Kennedy was dead before we got really going. You right. Know? Uh, but Johnson, having we having committed ourselves, essentially we had committed the prestige of the United States of doing Before it. this decade and, is out, we will put a man on the moon. And Johnson, more than that, was desperate to be seen as fulfilling Kennedy's heritage. Right. That he was the right man for Kennedy to have chosen as vice president. Right. And, and maybe it would help him uh, overcome the legacy of Vietnam a little bit as well. Well, a lot of things. Again... Most of the decisions on Apollo were made before Vietnam ever became all that big in people's uh, Interesting. lives. Interesting. You, we, you don't see that, but that's. But Apollo was was the big ace in the Cold War. That was the one that was going to demonstrate to the world that we, and not communism, were the people who knew how to get things done. Right. Can do. American know-how. Any of those phrases mean anything anymore? They they used to. Be <laughs> they big, used to. They used to. So, 
we did it. We did it the military way, and the military way builds a huge standing army, and then you go and do it. Now, having done it, the military way is then to disband the army. But we had built ourselves a, a, essentially a system of 25,000 development scientists, and the standing army had to be paid. You couldn't disband them. They were all civil servants. So we came up with the shuttle, whose job in life was to see to it that it employed 25,000 development scientists. It was a full employment program, not a scientific program. Yeah, well, it was both, but yes. Think about it. What's the cost per mission of a shuttle? I don't know, a few hundred million? You need any number you want because the budget stayed the same whether there was zero <laughs> or a hundred launches every year. Really? And go back and look at it. The budget didn't change. When we weren't launching shuttles at all, the budget was exactly <laughs> so the, the cost. cost was the cost was the employees, the staff, the cost, not the gas, not you know the liquid oxygen. NASA development scientists. Wow. Phil Chapman used to say back in the eighties that we had spent enough money that we ought to be halfway to Alpha Centauri by yeah. now, and we couldn't even get back to the moon. So, what should we have done instead? Disband the standing army at the end of the Apollo program and, and do it the way we built the Air Force. Put out a bunch of development contracts to a bunch of contractors and let them compete for each other for it. You've always been an advocate for private space exploration. No, I've been an advocate for competition. I wouldn't have minded if you had made the Navy and the Air Force compete for it. Ah. But you, to have a program that builds a big standing army, you're going to get paid whether they're successful or not, just almost never works. Yeah, a bunch of bureaucrats. So, but yet, well, they yet, weren't just a bunch of bureaucrats. These were, understand. Oh, they were scientists, they were of course. People. Yeah. But they were also people who couldn't do anything else. What so, jobs were there available for an expert rocket engineer except <laughs> with the approval of NASA? Right. Now, if we'd had space programs and right. ex my solution to the problem would have been X projects. Which by the way, and right, I had so right. with Newt Gingrich and um, and Bob Walker, and they were set to do it, but it didn't work out that way. The Republicans weren't in office for long enough after it, they weren't in office at all during the eighties, and nobody cared what Newt Gingrich and Bob Walker thought in the eighties. X projects are this: you go out to some place like Edwards or China Lake or some awful place where nobody wants to be because nobody ever built no empire's know-how out in China Lake. <laughs> nobody wants to be there. So you go out there and you tell them, I want you to build the best whatever it is you can build with technology as of this afternoon. Fastest ship we ever, the fastest airplane, the highest flying airplane, whatever. I want you to build one of those. You build three copies of it. We test one to the edge of it, and we probably prang it. We, the second one, we, learn, we, we fly because we learned from the first until we get all the information out of it. And the third one ends up in the Smithsonian. <laughs> and you do that until you build. And, and I'll give you an example. The, the stiletto, the X3 or 4, forget which one it was. It was the first airplane that took off from a runway, went supersonic, came back and landed again, okay, like an airplane. Well, it leaked. It, was, it wasn't slow. It was supersonic. But by the time it got turned around, it wasn't very maneuverable. But they took off from Edward, and by the time it got turned around, it was damn near to St. Louis, and it came back and landed. But the, the stiletto developed the technology for the 104 Starfighter, the F-104, and the F-104 Starfighter dominated military aerospace for about 20 years. It also proved to be a wonderful instrument for the Air Force to use to keep small countries from bothering us. You take, you, <laughs> we had better technology by that time, but everybody wanted 104s, right? Well, if you wanted to keep them from bothering us, you gave them some. It would take their entire national budget to keep damn things running, so... Here's some toys. You yeah. Play with these. Don't, don't bother. Don't me. have these. You've got the best airplanes in the well, world. Have fun at it. Now, cost I, do you not agree that Curiosity uh, was a was a great success? That we've done some interesting things, especially NASA on Mars. Can do wonders if given a specific task and people get out of the way. Yeah. What it can't do is support this big standing army. 
Well, let me give you an example. I used to be good friends with Dan Golden, who was the administrator of NASA. In fact, I think the biggest moment of terror in the history of NASA was when there was a short rumor that he, that, that that they were going to appoint me to be administrator. <laughs> but anyway, I went up there one time to the eighth floor, and it, the place was buzzing. There were people standing in lines for the copy machines and so forth. I went back to California and fooled around for a while. And about a month later, I went back there, and I go up to see Dan in his office up there, and, and, and the place is quiet as a grave. Hmm. And I said, D I read you got rid of some people. And he said, I fired a thousand people from NASA headquarters wow. here. Wow. And I said, wow. So I went around and started talking to people. And everybody, nobody quite knew who I was, but they knew I was a friend of the administrator and a friend of Mr. Gingrich's. And so everybody talked to me. And I said, H how are you doing? And he said, wonderful we're getting more work done than we ever got in our lives and i said why and he said well there's nobody in the way and i said well what did all those people do and he said you know we can't figure it out nothing we know worse they in middle have management been doing something, <laughs> but they're not in the, but we're getting the work done That's now awesome. and they're not here where would we be today if nasa had approached it this way project after project after project well, goal after goal after goal what should the goals have been if you go on to um, Kindle, you will find a whole bunch of my books, one of them called Exile and Glory, and there are some others about what I thought the, the world would look like in 2020. Asteroid mines, we're plowing out there at the edges of the reach of the galaxy, I mean of the solar system. We're not nowhere near going in. And we're staying away from planets because it's too hard to get off of them once you get back on them. But uh, we are building a, a, a spacefaring civilization. And I think that could have been done. And uh, It's not it too late, like, is it, Jerry? I mean, I hope it's not oh, too late. Oh, it looks like Elon Musk is trying to make it yeah. happen. It's It just took a lot longer than I thought. And there's less money for it. On the other hand, our technology is better. We can make stronger and lighter materials. Yeah, I mean, the last big space x project we ever had was the little dcx that was designed in my living room in which we <laughs> we sold to the vice president general graham and max hunter and i got a picture of us in the vice president's office when quail was 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 vice president and chairman of the national space council we built it the little thing flew up and hovered around and came down and landed on its own tail you know you know and reusable. You fill it up with fuel and you fly it again. We had intended a big 600,000 pound version of it that might or might not have made orbit, but would have been a real X project. Would have let you know what it took to make orbit with one. But they didn't have the money, so they built a scale model of it, 60,000 pounds. It was never going anywhere. But it did demonstrate that you can do it. You can mail the ship, fly it, bring it back, pump it full of fuel and do it again. We did 11 times. Same ship. I, how many missions? What's the most missions that any shuttle ever flew? Not I 11, forget how many. Sure, but, yeah. but the shuttle was not a reusable craft. It was rebuildable. And it took so dang long to rebuild it that it might as well not have been. Well, you see what I'm getting at. Do you, you think that the future of humankind is, is uh, in space? Well, I'll give you Arthur Clarke's observation. He says if humanity is going to survive then for all but a very brief period of its history, the world ship is going to have meant spaceship. Because what, how long is the Earth good for? hundred, few hundred million. Maybe another, maybe another couple of hundred million, but yeah. how long before a dinosaur killer hits us if we well, don't have anything but, to yeah, do about it? Right. We know that maybe every million years something with catastrophic multi megaton and every 10 million years something with many multi megatons of power right. and every 100 million years something as big as a thing that wiped out all the dinosaurs hits that's a pretty big event maybe i don't we know should how plan for that jerry well yeah i think so obviously <laughs> so that's my next that's my next novel is uh is is doing something about it yeah lucifer's hammer was about a uh Asteroid about a comet we couldn't comet. do anything about and how to how to survive it right. and uh, pretty dang good book uh, i agree it holds up very well i agree even though it's 30 years old next one's gonna be about not letting it happen